there we go. So we are recording. And I wanted to start us in a prayer because we should always start in prayer. Um, especially this is our first kind of Zoom of the season here as we're doing all these discussions. So let's begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the privilege of homeschooling. Thank you for the children whom you have so wonderfully created and entrusted to us. Thank you for the spouses who support and encourage our vocation with practical support and encouragement. Thank you for the individuals you place in our lives to inspire and guide us along this journey. We humbly embrace your divine mercy and offer our regrets for the many times we have doubted your presence and your power and turned away from you. Sweet Jesus, you were taught by our blessed mother's love, St. Joseph's hard work, and God the Father's infinite wisdom. Help us to imitate the intimacy and charity of your holy family in our own homeschools. God, please bless and strengthen our marriages and give us this day the heavenly graces we require to guide our children to a greater love of you and increase knowledge and understanding of the ordered world and goodness of humanity which you have created. May our hearts always be accepting of the holy will of our Father in heaven for our families, and may our ears be open to hear the guidance of the Holy Spirit in each moment. We surrender this hour and every coming hour to you, Lord, as we begin anew to love you and serve you. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yay. Um, that is something I always go back to is like any, any problem, any quandary, every debate I have in homeschooling, I'm always like, oh, wait, did I pray? <laughs> because it's very easy to get, you know, bogged down in all of the um, thinking and debating and decision making and all of those things. So I really think that's super important. So what the way I wanted to start tonight is just kind of touch base with each of you and see why are you here? Why are you on the call? What things are you feeling are your challenges or your, your goals for the coming weeks, months, years, um, and things that you maybe want to discuss? And then we'll kind of fold those into our questions as Charlotte and I chit chat. Um, so does anybody have something they're just itching to share or ask about? They're now, they put you on the spot, they're thinking. I do have a victory to share. Please. Okay, so my seven-year-old struggled with handwriting just from the beginning. Just the idea of sitting down to handwrite was a struggle for her. And so we just put it off and waited and put it off and waited. And then we finally started it, but it would just always ensue tears. So then I pulled back, just do a little bit every other day. Well, that little bit every other day was a huge challenge. And it was like she was starting over that every other day. and starting from the beginning, she wasn't really retaining any of the dexterity skills that required handwriting. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to suck it up. It's going to be painful for a couple of weeks. And we're just going to do a little bit every day, sweetheart. And she's like, what? Why? No. I said, no, sweet, look, let's just do a little bit every day. So we're not having these daily qualms because it's just ruining our relationship. And we're going to have to learn to handwrite. You're going to have to learn this. This is not something you're going to get away from. So, and, I, and it wasn't even two weeks. It was four days. And four days of doing it every day. And now it's beautiful. It's Aww. not a fight. It's not an issue. I think it was, I had the issue. <laughs> I don't think it was her. I just didn't want to see her complain. I didn't want to deal with the tantrum. Mm -hmm. And now she's enjoying it. Oh, I love it. And now she can't wait to get it done. That's so that was a victory that I saw this week. Yay. It's amazing Yay. what happens when we like just make a decision and go with it and see what happens. Yeah. I'm glad that turned out well. I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> wait till next Monday. Just that's the, the real test. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Who else? Who else? Qu quiet, quiet. It's okay, too. You can jump in later if there's things that come to mind. All right. Well, I am going to pick on Charlotte then, because I asked her ahead of time <laughs> to um, think of some tips that she felt would be helpful um, to those kind of starting out or kind of, even if you're not starting out, just kind of like tips on things that maybe when she was starting out, she felt, I wish I knew this. 
Is that right, Charlotte? Is that what I asked you? <laughs> what did you think of that you wanted to share? You have to find a mentor. You have to find somebody who has been there and can guide you through some of it. Like my first few years, I was messaging that lady every single day. <laughs> oh. so it, how, it how, made, did, how did you find her? She was my drama teacher in the homeschool group. <laughs> Ah, she yeah. is now the godmother to all three of my children. <laughs> Perfect. And so, like, I go to her for absolutely everything, whether it's schooling or not. You know, we've been having behavioral issues lately, and so I'm messaging her, okay, where do I go? Send me the right verses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything. Mm -hmm. so, but she has nine children and has homeschooled all of them, and she had like half of them are graduated already. And so I sent her messages on that and going, you know, what do I do? Where do I turn? And it has been a huge, huge thing for me. That's awesome that she's generous with her time in that way and her experience. I wish I had done that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's sometimes hard to find those people if they, you know yeah. yeah we live in an area that's not there aren't a lot of homeschoolers to begin with and then catholic homeschoolers are even fewer and we all live far few and far between mm -hmm. and i'm introverted and i'm not that great with a computer so <laughs> i'm getting better but, so maybe this is going to go for a few weeks, right? This a uh, couple of months, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> a couple of months. <laughs> okay, that's good. We'll see how things go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. N Nikki, were you going to jump in? I saw you pondering. No. Okay. <laughs> Don't want you to. Yeah, that's a that's a great tip is finding someone to guide you and um, I. Yeah, I had so many mentors over the years and finding someone that I could ask questions to and I mm -hmm. still ask questions and you never figure it out. I think that's my, I, whenever I talk to people, the new homeschoolers, I'm like, they're like, oh, you have it all figured out. I'm like, no, <laughs> because every kid is different. Every year is different. Every, you know, the dynamic changes. Um, you can't, and even having mentors, you can't really imitate what they do because your family is different. You mm -hmm. have different personalities and different strengths and different weaknesses and your and different dynamics in your household than they do. And you can get advice and kind of sort through all of that, but it's a constant discernment because we don't have it figured out. I mean, I, yeah, I've taught first grade. For, this is my fourth time to teach first grade, but I'm still figuring out how to teach this kid first grade um, while I'm teaching to high schoolers. And, you know, so it's, it's always changing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think in the beginning I fully gathered that. I thought, oh, you figure this out. And because I was a school teacher, so I thought I know how to teach. And yeah, that didn't. <laughs> it's definitely an ever evolving situation. Charlotte, what was your biggest challenge starting out? Learning my children. Oh. Learning how they learned so that I could reach them in the way that they needed to be reached. Hmm. What yeah. helped you with that? Like, how did you? I sat back and I watched him play. This one loves to be active and he has to touch everything and do. And this one likes to sit back and watch and he wants to be glued to the screen and he wants, you know, he has to hear it. He has, he's the one that's singing with the stuff and mm -hmm. things like that. And that made a huge difference. That's cool. So you feel like you adapt your homeschooling to what each of them needs in that regard. And I, I try to do like some of all of it with each of them mm -hmm. because the boys are so close together that they kind of bounce off of each other anyway. And so I like to have their curriculum very similar and I have some, you know, that caters to this one, but that that one can still grow with and that way they can help each other more. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. 
Hmm. I'm curious, Selena, since you've been doing this a bit too, what was your biggest challenge starting out? Um, biggest challenge starting out definitely was learning my personality and my needs as a mom because being a stay-at-home mom and then a homeschooling mom, it came fast and furious for me. It wasn't something that I was interested in. I didn't want to homeschool. My husband wanted me to homeschool. So I had to figure out really quick what was going to help me thrive as a mother because a peaceful mother is a better homeschooler Mm -hmm. than an anxious mother. Mm -hmm. So I'm an extrovert. I'm not an introverted. So we are obviously not thriving at this point. Um, but we are managing. And there was a point in time when I had to learn to manage when I had a newborn and I had a preschooler and when I had a newborn and I had a kindergartner. So, and it's whatever it took. So that if that meant we didn't fully homeschool kindergarten the way a kindergartner would in a traditional school would help us to thrive better as a family, that's what we needed to do. So what would look different, because I did hear a lot of opinions like, well, don't you feel like you're not giving enough to your child because she's not getting the schooling she would at a traditional school? And I had to learn that their opinion wasn't about me, it was more about themselves. And it's like, we are doing the best, what we can for my motherhood, for our family. And she's 10 and I have to bring her down to her reading levels, bring her reading <laughs> levels down to her age. So, so obviously she's fine. I worried about senseless things, but, and and at the end of the day, what was best for my personality was best for our marriage. And what was best for our marriage was best for our children. And what was best for our marriage, what was best for our homeschool. It's a a completely different mindset and it helped us thrive, especially since we didn't have any outside help. We don't have in-laws helping us. We don't have neighbors helping us. We're, We're pretty much isolated in the sense of childcare. So not putting too much pressure on myself in other areas as well. Yeah, that's really key. I mean, we talked about knowing your kids and knowing what works for them, but knowing mom, you know, mm-hmm. the best the best homeschool curriculum is the one that you'll do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the one you'll pick the, up at the The day. one you'll actually get done. Yeah. If mom hates yeah. it and it's not going to happen. Mm. Yeah. And then you you touched on to a really big thing is what other people think about your homeschooling is not the measuring stick, you know, Mm -hmm. because, and even just, I think one of my biggest challenges starting out was being a school teacher and previously, you know, teaching in public schools and kind of understanding that mentality and starting out teaching my kindergarten and, and realizing this isn't, this doesn't work the way the classroom works <laughs> and but should it and struggling with those like for, for me it mostly at that young age came out as scheduling issues with like well why aren't we staying on track and why aren't we scheduling things and why aren't we we'd get distracted and we'd do this and I had to learn to say hey if my five-year-old wants to go read about rabbits instead of the ducks that are in the book why does it matter <laughs> um, but you know just kind of shifting my mentality to like what both of you are saying, what does my family need right now? Um, and I'm still doing that, especially now with high school and, you know, three years into high school and I'm just now realizing, oh, I wish I'd done that a little differently. <laughs> but yeah, um, and we're, we're doing that right now. Like, how can I get time with my friends via Zoom? How can I work out more? What can I do to help me thrive in our situation so I can better equip my children? I think that's key. You know, self-care is like this big, catchphrase but in, and Charlotte I know you posted something on your wall about that but like mm-hmm. true self-care doesn't look like what the majority of the population thinks we're not talking manicures and although for some people that is important but you know um, but really like what's going to make mom find peace and be joyful and or at least you know able to continue each day doing the best thing for the kids and that's, especially with little kids or even teenagers, you know, sleep is probably like the hardest thing for moms. There's a reason why sleep deprivation is torture. Yes. <laughs> um, our brains don't work the same. Our emotions are, don't work the same. It messes up with our hormones and just, you know, just little things like that, that we realize, oh, you know, we have to figure out what our priorities need to be for our mm-hmm. families and serving them. Um, mm-hmm more important than the math book. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
which is important too, but you know, making those choices. Hmm. I like that a lot. So the biggest question, you know, people ask when you're starting out, and I think you, you ask it, what they don't realize is that you ask it every year as you keep going, is how do you figure out what to teach or what to choose? I mean, a lot of people will just pick a program and go with it, but what program? Or a lot of people will be like, nah, I don't do a program. But like, I mean, I'm not, we're going to talk a lot in the next couple of weeks, months about curriculum choices and options and things like that. But really, I'm wondering, like, for you guys, how did you make that decision or what, obviously, you're saying you factored in your kids' needs and your needs, but how do you just choose what to teach? So my main homeschooling goal is to teach my children how to learn and to teach them how to find the information that they need. Because as an adult, you don't get handed the information that you need to do your job. They tell you to go do it and you have to find that information that you need. And I want them to be well equipped to do that. And so for our schoolwork, now that both boys are reading really well, our science and history we're starting on research-based for all of that. Like I'm giving them a topic and I'm guiding them to start learning how to research, how to find their information. So that is our main focus right now for them. Neat, that's a really, so you choose your materials based on what, on facilitating their investigations, I guess is a good way to say that, yes? Yeah. Yes. I like it, nice. Selena? Uh, so our main focus was the saints and history. My husband really read himself into the church and I stayed in the church, basically reading stories of the saints and letters from our popes. So that's really the focus of our homeschool in the beginning was heroes of the church and what time period they came from and what would they eat and what was their culture like and where did they grow up what parish should they go to and just learning history through the saints that's why we started when they were little and we've continued that and now they've sort of taken that on their own and find saints that they've connected with and then we do math and we do writing but how we thrive as a family is finding those heroes and connecting with them and when it's their feast day, make that food. And that's what really is the culture of our family is the heroes of the church. That's beautiful. I love how both of you pointed out something that probably traditionally schooled kids aren't even like, that's it's not even on their radar for the most part. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, now granted they do research. Oh, I'm losing equipment, stay there. Okay. Um, Granted, they do research projects and they learn those things. And I'm, you know, if they're in a Catholic school, they're learning about the saints. But for that to be just the, the all-encompassing focus is fascinating. I was reading um, a post today by Julie Bogart. I don't know if you know Julie from Brave Writer. Um, she's kind of expanded into brave learning and more of a whole home education philosophy. But she was interviewed, I believe, by... Wall Street Journal or somebody be, um, because in this situation she's having a lot of parents who are seeing what their kids are learning in the schools at home now because they're looking at all their work mm -hmm. with coronavirus and the, and the quarantine and um, she's being asked by these parents like my kids not really like they're not learning important stuff or they're not learning hardly anything that's like seems relevant and is this really what is happening in our schools and not every school I'm sure is like this. There's many wonderful schools out there, but she was talking about how they are seeing, uh, these parents are identifying that the central focus of what their children are learning in schools isn't what they thought or what they hoped it would be. And they're identifying things more like what you're saying where isn't my kid like learning how to figure out which source is the best source, which is really important right now. Or, you know, isn't my kid learning about, um, their faith and the history of the world and how we should learn from, you know, things that have happened before. Um, like in some, we, I keep joking about this with friends, but I feel like I should do like a, a unit study on plagues or something <laughs> like, right. I'd be a little mm -hmm. morbid. I know too soon. Um, probably too soon. That but, was, that was our next project. My daughter wanted to know, like, are there things that have helped during times of the black plague, the Spanish flu, the great depression, economic times? What can we learn about mom? I know. So I, 
I, that's fascinating. I think maybe we should we should cobble something together because I saw um, even something that connects it with our faith. I saw someone mentioning, you know, trying to figure out what to do with masses in the Eucharist in this, this time. And someone was talking about like this a pa painting or maybe even just a, it was like a wood sketching of a priest who had like a super long patent and was like delivering the Eucharist through the door of a, it was like a pole. Yeah. Through like yeah. the window of a cottage or something. And during the Black Plague. And I was like, oh, you know, like we could learn a lot from our, <laughs> from the history. But um, anyway, so where I was going with that is just like, I think a lot of homeschoolers start out and they feel like they have to choose the right thing and do the right thing and imitate school in some way. But then they start to figure out that they can adapt that for what their family, even if they still are doing a very traditional curriculum or a very, you know, um, textbook oriented curriculum that doesn't mean that your focus on what you draw out from those things can't be one of these more um, life-giving or more kind of truth-centered things mm -hmm. um, and I love that I love seeing that happen I mean I was the mom who read everything I read all the websites I took all the quizzes about which philosophy and curriculum I should choose I went to the homeschool conferences in my friends houses and I was like what do you do for this and what do you do for this and tried to figure out what would be the best fit and and I did kind of pick something to start with and but by the time I got done looking at everything I realized it was all good you know, there wasn't anything that was just going to be a miserable failure necessarily, maybe a few things for me, but, um, but in general, I realized it didn't matter what I chose as long as I chose it and taught it in a way that worked for my family and my kids. So it's really cool that you guys are saying those things because that just echoes my experience too. It's really neat. So because this is for posterity and I know that this is something people ask a lot to kind of shifting a different direction. Um, I know this is going to be odd because three of us are in Texas, but oh. state laws. <laughs> um, I know that's something that people forget is, is super important and does limit and does um, kind of control what you're, right. you, what you're allowed to teach, what you're supposed to teach. Um, Marianne, how, what is that like in Massachusetts? Can you tell us so that we have a perspective there? Well, Massachusetts is known as one of the, you know, highly regulated states. And it, what happens is it, it, it goes town by town. Mm. Like the, each town has its certain ways of operating, but there is a, a state law generally that we all have to follow and we have to 900 hours cover all these subjects. And um, so it, it is, tough, but I'm not, I haven't had any bad experiences except for the last couple of years where the superintendent has tried to get more than she's entitled to. Other than that, it wasn't real difficult, but um, some of the towns can be really tough. They had the HSLDA came into the city, I think last year had to help out, but. Mm -hmm. Mostly because they're asking for more information than is needed uh, and more yeah. specifics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they did it to a whole group of people. So not just individuals. Right. But, um, but do you feel that those limit you or it sounds like you've, well, it didn't help me because I'm one of these people. I could, I perceived originally that it was just like school at home. Mm -hmm. So, and then I saw the law and what the law you know, in theory, wanted me to do. So I just fell right into school at home and being very nervous about fulfilling all the requirements by law. And um, I think it just really got me on, off on the wrong foot. Oh. So because of my personality and this being a highly regulated state. So. Right. You're a rule follower. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, we um, were blessed here in Texas, we don't have to register or, or document anything wow. at all. We have um, a certain, there's certain subject areas we're supposed to cover, but they're mm -hmm. very broad and no one ever checks that we do that. Um, I know HSL, AD, uh, HSLDA recommends we keep some kind of pl lesson plans or books or proof somewhere mm -hmm. so that if someone comes to our door, we can be like, yeah, we follow the state law. Mm -hmm. um, but even with that, I've met many homeschoolers in Texas who still feel very 
but I have to teach, what's the one, um, citizenship or something? Mm -hmm. It's like a very vague thing. How do I teach that? I'm like, um, teach them to be nice to their neighbors. <laughs> you yeah. know, there, there's lots right. of, of different ways to, to, to interpret Don't damage that. your library books. Yeah, be good to the environment. I don't know. Um, take care Pick of each trash. other. <laughs> Pick up trash. Go vote with mom. Like, go when mom votes. Yeah. Um, but I know people who, you know, even in Texas do choose to track attendance or track hours or things like that for their own benefit to help mm -hmm. them compare or sometimes to help husbands feel better about um, how things are going. So I'm curious, um, Selena, Charlotte, like have you guys had any thoughts or experiences with needing to kind of regulate yourself or come up with some kind of um, structure for that? No, um, about, once a year or so, I end up getting online and doing one of the monthly internet curriculums, like Time for Learning and things like that. And I plop the kids in about where they should be and I see how they do. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. It's good. it's good to have a gauge. Yeah. I always say every kid in every educational scenario everywhere in the world has gaps. So I like yes. to know where my kids are. I'm not going to say they're not going to have gaps, but it's exactly. good to know where they are sometimes. Yeah. What about you, Selena? So I was going to see, can I show this? I don't know if I can. No, it's too bright. Let me turn it down. Okay. So can you see my calendar? Mm -hmm. That's my school calendar and my phone. Mm -hmm. But that's just for me. So the kids don't see that. They don't see the time requirements. It's just a list for the day. And yeah. I have that list posted for the kids, but it's only for a two hour span. Mm -hmm. So this is our goals for these two hours. The rest of the day we're free to do what we choose, what we want that does not involve screen time. Mm -hmm. So you can play outside, we can go for walks, we can bake in the kitchen, but just for these two hours, these are our goals. Mm -hmm. And I keep track of those two hours um, when we're not in a high feast time, when we're not in Advent, when we're not in Lent, when we're not during Easter time, um, and when it used to be when dad was home. <laughs> That's changed that things. <laughs> so, but yes, we have two hours, majority of our days where we do some formal schooling and it keeps me on track. It keeps them on track. It helps them feel productive and they tend to have a better self image of themselves the rest of the day. Right. I've noticed when we get to feasting times and we get to relax times, there's just a lot more fighting going on. Like, all right, maybe we need to do something together, feel productive. Mine too, so. whenever we don't regularly sit down to do some kind of schoolwork and they just have all of this extra free time, they just start butting heads a lot more. Yeah, it's interesting that you two both have started your school years just now. Um, we're finishing up our school year and I was talking to a friend on Saturday and she was like, so if you guys finish before this whole quarantine thing is over, what are you going to do? And I'm like, we're going to do something else. Like I'm going to pull out unit studies or whatever we can pull out so that we still have that structured time each day because I don't know what we would do without that. Um, yeah. It, that's cool. Well, I have lived in, I've homeschooled now in three different states. Um, so I can share those experiences. And then I think high school is a whole other ball game too, as far as, you know, tracking and things. So that's a whole different call to talk about, but that requires a little bit more um, paying attention to things. But we started homeschooling in Michigan, and um, you had to register with the district, but you didn't have to turn anything in at the time. Um, and so I really didn't have, it didn't affect me. I had to have the superintendent letter or whatever. Um, and I think we had to keep plans so that they could if they called on us to submit them, we could, I forget how that worked, or maybe some plans had to go in. That was so long ago. <laughs> um, but I do remember having to have a binder of plans. So I didn't feel like that affected me that much. At the time, we also just, because um, I was starting out, we picked the curriculum and we kind of followed what, um, what, that, what that indicated. So I felt like I had a kind of a backup and said, oh, you know, I'm doing this and this is a developed curriculum. And then we moved to Florida and Florida required registration and annual assessment of some type. And I was kind of grumbling about that because we knew I'm from Texas. We knew we always wanted to come back to Texas and I knew the homeschool laws in Texas were nice. Um, so I did grumble a little bit about Florida having to do some assessment, um, but it was interesting. And I think it was a good experience for me because um, 
there were three choices. You, you could enroll in an umbrella school, which I wasn't going to do. You could do a standardized test, or you could have a certified teacher, um, what was it called, portfolio review with your child, and you had to like just show work throughout the year in like a kit mm -hmm. that they could look through and ask your child questions about it. Um, so at the re recommendation of some mentors, I did the portfolio review, and part of that was you were supposed to write, um, have a book list included of every, any book you used for education. So I had to compile that, and I had to pull papers and kind of compile a portfolio. And it was really, first of all, enlightening for me to look back and be like, oh, look at all we did. Because by that point, I'd kind of stepped away from the set curriculum and it was kind of doing pick and choose and kind of changing things up even more. Um, so that was helpful. But then when I sat down with the evaluator and they, he explained to us that the state law is that you have to, the evaluator has to see progress from the beginning of the school year's work till the end of the school year's work. And so you were supposed to have like samplings throughout the year. And I, I kind of thought for a second and we had this conversation about it. There was no standard as to where a second grader or fourth grader had to be. It was just that child had to show progress from the beginning to the end of the year. And since that time and that conversation, that's been my personal like goal setting for my kids, picking curriculum for my kids. I want to see them make progress from the beginning of the year to the end of the year in some way. And that's been incredibly helpful to me um, to stop worrying too much about where the gaps are and how we're going to get to everything because I can just look at their progress. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that was a positive experience because I'm kind of more of a like, I'm a rule follower too and I want to make sure all the boxes are checked. Um, but just keeping that in mind was helpful. High school, that's been a whole other story. I keep very detailed lesson plans so I can make the transcript because I don't use a service um, or a set curriculum. Um, and that's a whole other ball game. But um, so I think, you know, and I, I know Marianne, I have friends who are in states where they count hours um, just like you do. And I love hearing from them what they count as hours, you know, besides just book work because life is learning too. Yeah. And I love to hear how they um, identify learning time because I think, oh, wait, I do that and I don't count that as school, you know, things like that. Um, and I have, um, uh, that just escaped me. I was going to tell about another friend, but what, where is she? I don't even know where she is. So anyway, so I, I like hearing how the state regulations, we don't like them a lot of the times, but they can sometimes help steer us. They can sometimes help give us that guardrail or whatever to keep mm -hmm. going. Um, I think we all do a good job, you know, no matter where we are and what we're doing. So it's something to consider. And if you're starting out homeschooling, you definitely have to know those laws. Don't ignore them um, mm -hmm. and do that. So let's see where we are on my questions here. I think we've covered what I put. What else is on your mind and on your heart as far as where you're headed next? I know um, it sounds like most of us kind of have been homeschooling a bit and we're doing this thing and we're keeping going, but it's, it's always keeping going. That's the, <laughs> you know, what do we keep the same? What do we change? And what that's, mm -hmm. we're going to spend a lot of time next week kind of evaluating all those details, but what's on your heart right now as far as what do I do now? Anybody? Well, mine is that like the two, the differences between my two sons. Um, <clears throat> one is severely dyslexic and, um, He's like technically in eighth grade, but he's, he's not really functioning at an eighth grade level anywhere. And the other one is, but he's highly motivated. <laughs> he gets up and even before breakfast, he starts his work. The other one is just been, he's very bright and it's just been a battle. So this year I did something called the Robinson method with him. Mm -hmm. Whereas we were doing things like Seton type things before. And he's really on his own, but I think he feels badly. But I was just so exhausted from the battle last year mm -hmm. that this is a very independent type of a method. Yeah. Don't know that it's the right thing because I think he feels kind of like I, he, I don't give him much attention. But like Charlotte, I mean, he's he's bright enough to learn on his own and that's what he has to do. But 
I feel guilty because yeah. I work a lot with the other one, you know, um, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I'm sure he needs lots of your constant. Yeah, yeah. that's hard. It's always hard, no matter how many, you know, kids you're teaching. If there's more than one, it's that juggling of who needs my attention for what, when, and who needs it more. And, you know, it's it's all of us probably juggle juggle that right and figure that out. I know with my, Absolutely. when we transitioned, I mean, I'm my goal kind of like Charlotte and what you're saying, Marianne, is for all my kids to be able to be independent workers. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's important. They need to figure it out. And so kind of we make these changes in middle school where they're more independent and then I miss them so much <laughs> <laughs> because all of a sudden they're doing it all by themselves and mm -hmm. my high schoolers go off and do school and I could not interact with them for much of the day. But, um, but I choose, well, with them, you know, I'm deliberately choosing like one thing each um, – a semester that we're together discussing or we're getting together to look at together, you know, and see. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a challenge. There's that. And then flip side is I have two boys that are pretty close in age, fairly close in ability. But if I try to do the same things with them, it's a disaster. So they have to be doing different things, which mm -hmm. is like more work for me. <laughs> um, but then I have to balance out, you know, their attention as well so it's always a constant like discerning and praying and thinking you know what does this kid need what does this kid need you know how do I do that Selena or Charlotte what are your experiences with kind of the balancing so act? the boys my boys are only 13 months apart and when my, we actually put our oldest in public school for pre-k because of some of his other issues we thought you know that would help him more and so he would come home and he would do his homework and his little brother would be right there with him and he did all of it and he knew it. So whenever we pulled my oldest out and we started homeschooling him, we just put my young and um, my middle one in there with him and had them doing the same stuff. Not a good idea. Um, <laughs> they'd sit there and Sammy would be copying on his brother's work and because he could. <laughs> and he didn't have to try and so that was a struggle for quite a while until I learned that you know I've got to have them on different stuff mm -hmm. and now they're on different levels if finally um Johnny has gotten to where he needs to be and Sammy had to redo a few things to stay where he needed to be but so that right there has been a struggle but something that we did we, we started this a few months ago. We got some little bitty wooden tiles and I put numbers on them. <laughs> and they stay in the middle of the table while we're doing our schoolwork. And whoever wants my attention next grabs the next number. <laughs> like at the grocery store deli with the ticker tickets. <laughs> hey, works. do what works, exactly. I love it. I love it. It's important to figure out a system that's gonna work, yeah. Selena, what about you guys? So I've come up with the realization that I can't meet every kid's needs every day. I just can't. I've, and I've decided to give that up. So this year, my goal is to spend at least half an hour, an hour, one-on-one -on -one time that's not school every week with each child to try to solidify that relationship side, especially as my oldest, as she transitions into middle school and with my youngest as he transitions into school. He's still in that pre-K age, transitioning to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And like you said on your live uh, message of the day, like it's all about relationships. And I know how to teach the things and they are bright children. But what I need to focus on is relationships and how can I transition into that? Because that was the whole reason why we decided to homeschool was to be intentional with our time. And so letting the education side handle itself through the relationships that we form. So yesterday I went on a 30 minute walk with my seven year old. Wow. She had like 20,000 words in that 30 minutes. It was a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> but as we got through like the surface level stuff she wanted to talk about, there were some deeper things that were going on in her brain and in her heart that she had never been gifted the time to talk to me about. Mm -hmm because brother's always complaining 
dad is needy, sister wants to do something fun, and she's just the middle child. And it was a beautiful time. Like, okay, I need to do that. Not every day. <laughs> once a week. <laughs> no myself. Yeah, those are that's that's very good goal to have that reasonable expectation. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's awesome. I love that. What about you guys as far as where you are and what you're thinking about and deciding? And I mean, you've just started a new school year though. So maybe you're like gung ho, we're going, this is, this is what we're doing. The oldest is not excited to start written narrations, (laughs) not excited. So I never really expected narrations of her. She's always been a good writer in the sense of writing the answers for her curriculum. But the idea of taking a a chapter, a passage from a chapter and writing a paper about it. She has not done that yet, but that's the transition to middle school. Mm-hmm. Not excited, not enthused. Yeah. Does not like. So it's going to be fun. Yay. Small bits at a time. Day mm-hmm. by day, by day, it gets better. Yeah. What about you, about you, Charlotte, trying to have any big thoughts on your mind and We have started focusing once a day on only the Ten Commandments. And because we were having a lot of behavioral issues recently. And so we sit down and we're like, okay, what is the first commandment? They say it. We talk about it. Have you broken that commandment today? You know, what, how can, you know, what are the different ways that we can break that commandment? And then we move on to the second one and we do that one. And then after we do all of them, then we say our prayers and then we get started with the stuff. And that has helped a lot. And it's helped a lot with like my middle child and his lying and things like that, because it's bringing it back constantly of, that's not a mommy rule. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> made a big difference lately, adding that in every day. Mm-hmm. That's fabulous. I love that idea. It's, it's amazing how... Um, how things improve when you address issues outside of the moment, right? When you bring something up when it's not like in the heat of the moment (laughs) and you figure that out. That's cool. That's cool. Well, I think where we are is, like I said, we're finishing up. Like I'm dragging out my elementary boys because I'm like, we're not stopping if until we can like get back to going places. Um, But I, once my kids get to middle school, they pretty much, like I said, are independent. I hand them their list. They do what they do each week. And somewhere in the spring, usually April, May, I give them the end of the year list and say, here's your list. You, this is everything you need to get done to be done, to be done for the year and have your summer break. And um, for years and years, we school through mid-June and start in mid-August. So we kind of have like an eight-week break in the summer, but we, we stool into June. But with the situation right now and everything going on, we're getting all, they're getting a lot done because they don't have their activities. They're not leaving the house all the time. And they're both going to be done by the end of May um, pretty easily. And I'm like, okay, like, am I okay with that? <laughs> um, what are they going to do with their time? And because um, they're teenagers and if they're still stuck at home, that's going to be interesting. But um So that's where I am is kind of like, okay, how is this year going to end and how are we going to finish this out? And then what does the summer look like? Do I need to make it look different than usual? And, and I love planning for next year. I'm already thinking and, you know, I know some things I want to tweak and things I want to change and how I want to do things. And I love just having those conversations and thoughts. It takes me a lot of thinking, um, to, to really, um, come to decisions. I have to think and I have to research and I have to talk about it. I'm a talker (laughs) and I have to kind of get through all that. So that's where I am. And I'm really excited to be kind of in the place where I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to think about this. I have, I know there were some moms in the group who were like, I can't even get done with the school year. (laughs) So we'll have to chat on ways to do that too. But that's where we are. Um, Okay. Since Nikki is muted, she sent us a chat asking, how much do you do together with all the different ages? Does everyone do all separate things, some subjects together, morning time? Um, I'm going to start here and then see what Charlotte and Selena say. So since I have this broad ages, um, when we started out, my younger two, no, my older two now, um, they're three years apart 
and then the younger two are three years apart and there's a five year gap between them. So when I had just the two, um, we did a lot together and um, we basically did all of the content subjects together, which are like history, science, fine arts, um, literature, those kinds of things. And then we did the skill subjects separate. So the math, the spelling, the handwriting, the you know, composition, although we did composition kind of together, it was still, you know, distinct kind of goals. Um, and as they've gotten older, they've separated out and they do everything, you know, separate as far as their main subjects. Um, my younger boys are also three years apart, but the older one has some um, executive functioning issues. And so he's kind of back a little bit. And then the younger one, I think, is gifted. So he's up a little bit. So they're pretty close. And as I said, I tried to go back to what we did with my older ones, where we had like science and history and all these things together. And it was just, they were competing against each other and fighting each other because they didn't want to do it together. Um, so I've kind of separated that out, although we're all in the same room. So I'm deliberately still choosing things that I want them both to hear. And I go back and forth between the two. So I am kind of doubling up on some things. Um, the history read alouds I double up on. This is your book. This is your book. But they're both hearing it. Um, so they, are, they have a lot more that's different. But we do all do morning time still. And I love that ages seven to 17, we can get together. We get together about three mornings a week. I don't necessarily get to it every single day because it's just things going on, even when we're all home, because there's things that happen. Um, but we get together for morning time and we pray and we'll, like right now we're praying, we're reading a verse from the Bible and talking about it, a paragraph of the catechism and talking about it. We've been memorizing poetry together and we'll memorize like an easy poem and a hard poem at the same time all together. And they each gain from it what they do. Um, so we do do that all together and love that. So, it, but it changes every year, I think too, because I do dynamic of my kids, the ages, what we're gonna be learning about. Um, and I'll say even my high schoolers, they are doing some of the same subjects actually, freshman and junior, um, but they're not really doing them together. They're just like, here, you're both doing American literature. You do this and you do this and I differentiate it a little. So that's an excellent question. So Selena, Charlotte. We combine history as a family. So we all listen to the same history curriculum, um, but there are different expectations as far as what I would ask of each child. So Augustine, can you sit down and color a page and not hit your sister while we're listening to this history curriculum? That's my expectation of him. Lucia, like I go through the outline and ask her questions, Rebecca's the narration. So our subjects are the same. Literature, we're actually separated. We read a lot in our family. So my daughter, my fifth grader, has her own literature curriculum that she handles on her by herself. But she does sit for our read alouds as a family, what we are doing for literature. We do have morning time every morning with the five of us. Even dad is memorizing a poem with the family. Um, and we're memorizing the uh, spiritual communion prayer right now and reading through the scriptures that traditionally come after Easter as a family. Um, and we started that, I guess, about a year ago. And it was very fruitful. And I asked Richard, like, well, should I change it? Should I miss it, mess with it? He's like, well, let's change it when they're like, oh, I've heard this story before. And we haven't gotten that that sentence yet so they're still enjoying it and so it's been really fruitful for us um, mathematics and like skill work it's all different my oldest has really advanced she does Saxon math on her own I just grade it my middle one's definitely a challenge she's second grade year but still in first grade math and my youngest he's not there yet count bricks go out <laughs> so. awesome yeah Charlotte what about you guys so we start our day with just practicing our prayers and going over the commandments, going over the seven sacraments, kind of really instilling that. Um, Johnny, our oldest, he knows him. He knew him enough to pass his interview with father last year, but um, <laughs> so he still needs a lot of practice with all of that. And Sammy is supposed to be doing his first come his first communion this year. So we're really practicing that with all, with him. And then we just sit down and we do our schoolwork. And I like to have them all right here at the same spot because they all need quite a bit of attention still. 
So my table, my husband built me an awesome table that is like very unique shaped. And so I have this really long side and it fits like in the corner of the room and each child has their own little side. And so I separate them all out and we spread out books and I give them, you know, one book at a time and we just kind of go from there. Um, they're doing master books this year. And so like their first day starts with this long story that they have to read. And so I have all three children starting their week on a different day. That way, you know, I get to sit down and read with this one while those two just go and do the worksheet that's on that day. And I can focus easier and not have to try to read three long stories back to back. <laughs> three children. <laughs> so that has helped quite a bit. That's really wise. I had, I ran into that today. My voice started giving out. <laughs> I was like, oh, because I, I, with my two elementary kids, I go back and we sit together and then I go back and forth, say, what do you want to work on next? And we do that. What do you want to work on next? What do you want to work on next? And so I'm back and forth, but my voice and I was like, okay, we need to do something like math where mom doesn't have to talk the whole time for a few <laughs> minutes <laughs> um, because that was definitely the juggling, but I'm constantly just that they take turns and they go back and forth and need me and sometimes they can work independently while I'm working with the other kid but sometimes they can't sometimes there's not something they could do independently so they just there's things in the schoolroom that they can do like felt and puzzles and things while they're waiting for me and they kind of just learn that you gotta take turns figure it out I keep it short I mean I think that's the one thing I've especially with elementary school kids, like it's just, it does not need to be long lessons. They can be really short. And as long as they're hitting it every day, they pick up a lot. So that helps. Yeah. That's a great question, Nikki. Mm -hmm. I hope we answered it. And I know Casey's been quiet. Okay, Casey, if you have anything you want to drop in the chat box or you want to ask us before we close, feel free. But this has been really nice. I've really enjoyed mm -hmm. this. And we're definitely doing more like you saw. I want to do this and my husband when we first started this whole um when we first started this whole quarantine he and I did like one or two zooms he was like you should do that like every night so apparently it <laughs> fed me in some way and he noticed that it was a positive thing so I have full reign to do um a bunch but um I enjoy it I enjoy just talking and brainstorming and hearing mm -hmm. what other people are doing because it definitely inspires me too I know that whenever I hear from other homeschoolers both beginners and seasoned and in between I always hear things that you know they stick in your brain and then you start to toss them around and um, especially with those new to homeschooling that's my thing is I love talking to newbies because they have such enthusiasm and but they have that appropriate fear of like I have to do a good job because mm -hmm. I can kind of become mm -hmm. complacent a little bit and be like eh, it doesn't matter anymore <laughs> um, so I need that kind of like oh yeah I need to make sure I'm doing the best job possible mm -hmm. for my kids so I love these conversations. Any closing thoughts before we sign off tonight? We're gonna talk Saturday morning about like why we homeschool and that has so many different facets to it. It can be um, why you started homeschooling, why you're homeschooling now, the benefits you've seen in homeschooling that are kind of surprising and are wonderful to you, um, the challenges maybe you faced outside of homeschooling or you know what was negative that made you decide or right now what's you know driving you to this I know a lot of people have different reasons and I think hearing other people's reasons can always help us um, make ours more concrete and more identifiable okay. so that's what we'll do next okay good to All chat right. with you ladies we'll good. chat more in the group and in the coming days okay good thank you god bless you all good night you too. good night, good night.